Welcome to the DIGS 2020 election special on benefit levels. I'm joined by Susan St. John, an Associate Professor of Economics and the spokesperson for the Child Poverty Action Group, by Serena Nicholson, the General Manager of Lower Hutts Farnell Family Support Services Trust, and Donna Maria Lawson, a benefits advocate, mother and community activist. Um, Donna, let's start with you. You had experience working, I mean, being on a benefit, being a sole parent. What, how difficult is it to survive on a, on a benefit? It's extremely difficult. Um, the core cool benefit's nowhere near enough, and even the supplementary or add-on benefits, accommodation benefit, uh, disability allowance, etc., those benefits haven't uh, been looked at for years now um, and they in no way keep up with rental increases, et cetera, in the private sector. And we are all very much aware of the shortage of uh, social housing and affordable uh, rents. So it's extremely difficult. Um, and for me, I've not had the... My daughter is part of my benefit for six months now. She's in her first year at, at uni, but life hasn't got any easier um, because the student allowance is exceedingly low. Um, we're probably worse off now than what we were. So I'm going back to benefit rights um, as an advocate fairly soon because I'm immune compromised and my doctor has said that, yep, I can do a couple of days a week. Very much the message that I'm getting is that the recommendations that were made by the Welfare Working Group, none of that really has progressed. It has been a tiny amount of tinkering around the edges and that's about it. When I was trying to put this panel together, I spoke to a mm -hmm. number of people on benefits and they told me stories that were quite upsetting. One a mother who has cerebral palsy, mm -hmm. three kids, and the thing that really broke her heart was that her kids couldn't play soccer. She just couldn't afford to pay the fees, couldn't get them the boots. Did did you find things like that while you were, you know, bringing up your daughter? How often were you feeling like you just couldn't participate in society in the way that you think people should be able to? For me personally, it was less evident through the primary school years um, and very evident through high school. Um, it was very stark through high school, which also that potentially may have something to do with the high school that that you went to here in Wellington, the city, I, I'm not entirely certain, but high school, in my personal experience and from other people I know, is a more expensive um, issue, really. And also, I, I have one child. But I know for a lot of people, they feel that their, their children go without. And the types of things that go without? obviously has a, a, a big knock-on effect, because as a parent, it means that it's things that you may do for yourself, and I'm not talking luxuries, I'm talking eating, I'm talking getting health care. You just, that stuff, it suffers. You know, you eat less. I mean, that, that sounds sort of bizarre, but it's a reality. Now, I don't go to the doctor, even now. I don't go to the doctor. It's become that ingrained. It has to be virtually life-threatening, and then I'm more likely to present at A&E. Serena, is, is that your experience? Are the families that you're dealing with regularly having to make these types of decisions? Yeah. Yeah, they do, Jeremy. Um, you know, it's... Uh, it's very hard for a lot of the families, and you're right, Donna, you know, um, the things that you have to give up is actually eating, and that's what happens with a lot of our families. That's the first thing they will give up. It, um, and uh, a lot of our families, I'm working with, so I'm working with um, single, my team, I should say, are working with singles, uh, families, um, uh, families, grandparents who are raising their um, grandchildren, Kaumatua and Mukupuna. So working across a, a 
uh, big field. And I think if it wasn't uh, for the support that we have um, and the partnerships that we have grown um, over the you know, over a long period, but actually when I think through um, COVID four coming down to COVID one, you know, I I think if it wasn't for those um, networks of, of agencies that are social agencies and actually food agencies that I'm working with, many of our families who have had uh, really stressful, very stressful lives and what have you, um, the food has been the first to go. So we, as an organisation, what we do is we put them onto our list and then we let our agency partners know we need this here's a family, here's the situation, and uh, these are the amounts of people in their houses, and could you provide us with some support for them? Because they will need that support for a while just to bring their budgets up and what have you. And so uh, often, uh, is, it, is it quite often that the grandparents are the ones who are having to support their, their mokopuna because they they're on a slightly more generous benefit actually in, in, in super. So do you find that families are helping each other out? Uh, definitely um, happened in, uh, during COVID four, but yes, generally there are two and three um, generations of families in one one household, um, and also grandparents raising their own grandchildren and. Even in that, you know, uh, depending on the ages of the grandchildren, as an example, we have um, a grandpar grandparents who have um, a two-bedroom place, but what they decided to do was to um, purchase a, a, um, a batch outside their house um, for the grandson, because you've got three great, you know, three um, teenage, two teenage girls and one boy and they you know they clash in areas and what have you and this grandparent researched that she could buy one of those um, batches for a particular amount and so for for an agency like ours it's a it's been a privilege to be able to help families like that because what it does it also takes the um the stress off the whole family by providing a space where, where part of the children, grandchildren can go to or just to give them some extra space to work from. But food has always been the first thing to go. And of course, and um, yeah, it's a privilege to be able to support our families that um, need support. And that that was one way that we can do it. Susan, we, you know, it's almost 30 years since the mother of all budgets. So we've had generations trying to survive on these very, very low benefits. Just how low, far below where they should be are they? I mean, in your view, how much do they need to go up? Well, different families are in different circumstances, so it's not just one answer to that, which is why the Welfare Expert Advisory Group said that benefits needed to increase by between a certain range up to 47 percent, like they said. Um, having said that, we punched the figures, and if you're just looking at a core benefit and you're thinking, how far away from the poverty line is that core benefit? If you just had the core benefit alone, how much more would you need to get up to one of the government's poverty lines? And what we found is that the core benefits are way below the lowest poverty line, which is 40% of the average household income, um, sometimes under 30%. So obviously what's going to happen is that those families, Sarah and I have been talking about this, need all these extras because otherwise they just would not survive. Uh, so in order for us to move to something which is more civilised, after 30 years, of this experiment starting in 1991, that budget, we have to substantially increase the benefits. And we would like it to be such that you move even beyond the need for things like an accommodation supplement, um, except in particularly difficult circumstances, so that 
it would be that it would be an unusual thing for a family to have to go and ask for a supplementary payment of any kind. But that is a utopian uh, vision that we have. We're obviously not under this government that we've experienced the last few years, or even the next one, going to see that kind of change. So we have to put in place things that are manageable, that are doable, and, and insist that they are done. Um, and I just wondered if I could ask Donna, um, Donna, in your years of bringing up those young kids, would it have made a difference to you if you had had an extra $72.50 a week? Huge. Well, there you have it. Within our working for families policy, we deny the worst of families, mm. like donors, the full working for families tax credits, which are for the children, for the purpose of relieving poverty. But because of the neoliberalism and the thinking that was introduced in the 1991 budget, it's become thinking that some families are more deserving than others. They're more deserving than others because they're not on a benefit. So you can be on a benefit and you can be working part time, but that's not good enough. Any income at all from the benefit, your children miss out on that $72.50. And that's been in place since 2006, so that's 14 years. And every year that is meant that the very lowest income families have been denied about half a billion, billion dollars. So we're talking about balance sheets at the end of that 40-year period, which have been undermined to the tune of $7 billion. It's no wonder that we're seeing the degree of misery that we are, and the families that Serena is talking about that are living in tomorrow, that very fortunately are able, in some instances, to call on intergenerational support, grandparents, and, and to, to live in communities that will help each other. But the fundamental structural issue is that our policies have been wrong. They have not put children at the centre. They have put paid work at the centre. And that's not to say that paid work is a bad thing or, or that it isn't good to have a job. We're not saying that at all. We're saying we want to have policies that put the needs of people and prioritise our children rather than the needs of business. Because that's what has happened over the last... 30 years, we've gradually put not children and people at the centre, we've put paid work at the centre and the needs of business. Well, that kind of brings us to, to what is on offer this election. Donna, you got in touch with me after hearing that morning report debate, I suppose, between Carmel Cicalone and Louise Upston. And you weren't impressed. Do you want to share with us a little bit what frustrated you about that discussion? Um, look, there was certainly nothing that came out of Louise Upstone's mouth, really, that was at all surprising. And with, with Carmel, Carmel Cibolone, I just feel, and the Labour government or coalition, I just feel really disappointed. Um, I, you know, I thought the recommendations that did come out of the advisory group and from my perspective both as somebody who has been on benefit actually still currently is on benefit but has worked within benefit rights specific advocacy there is nothing radical in those recommendations and really none of them have been adopted and I find it very difficult to get past that um, I mean, those recommendations. I think it's, the recommendations pardon? really were the recommendations are about trying to bring us back to a point where someone on a benefit can participate in society. Exactly. And yeah, not at a high level, but simply without having to, as you say, go without food or not their kids not play sport or not be able to have access to the internet, all those things which are mm -hmm. vital to... For and, I mean, I, I appreciate it's not a one-dimensional issue, you know, there's issues around 
housing. Um, if you have to move a lot of times and you, you, your children have to keep moving school, you know, that has an impact. Food surety has an impact. Um, being able to be part of any form of um, community or not, those things have huge impacts. Um, but if you're at least able to provide reasonable food, look at sustainable longer-term housing, um, raise your child or children without feeling the sense of humiliation almost if you have to deal with MSD, those to me are they're places to start. They're starting points. Well, let's, you know, and the core cool benefit, it's impoverishing. It's impo you know, it is poverty. There is no other way of putting it. So so what we've been told from Labour is that they mm -hmm. will increase the abatement level up to 160 from, I think, is it 90 now? Um, yeah. And they will reinstate the training allowance for sole parents, uh, something which both Louise Upston and Carmel Cepoloni made good use of when they were themselves on a benefit. How much of a difference, do you, Serena, do you think those things would make the slight increase or I suppose a significant increase to how much you can earn? And um, I mean, it is interesting. When that was first set, I think in 1986, it was said at the equivalent of three days' pay, so someone on a benefit could work for three days and keep what they earned. Um, it's well below that still, you know, even with what they're proposing. But would it make a difference, Serena? Well, interestingly enough, Jeremy, in 1991, there was a group of us that went to feedback to um, Social Policy Agency when they were... Um, um, Department of Social Welfare, and um, we we were able to um, talk to the, um, to the department about family. The abatement level was too low, and so at that time it was sixty dollars, and um, and so uh, part of what we said it should be was around one hundred and twenty dollars, but probably from the department level, you know, we knew that it wouldn't be that, and it went up to 80. And, uh, and, in, and it's only gone up an extra $10 since then, since 1991. So that's just out of whack. It's out of whack. So, you know, our families, that $170 or so would be so helpful to the families, so helpful. Like you were saying before, um, Donna, we'll be able to uh, be able to... Like our children, for instance, if we want them to be involved in activities, we have to pay for those activities. Our parents have to pay for those activities. And so it, it becomes very hard for them to do that. I think about the Māori families who have, um, you know, maybe even four kids that are still at primary. How do you, how do you cope with that? It means that nobody's going to go and play rugby unless somebody, a rugby team or picks them all up, puts all the kids up and is able to donate them boots for um, for practices, pick all the kids up, because they might be with a solo um, single parent. You know, the kids might be living with their mum, who's not going to be able to take four kids to a rugby game and buy them all boots for practice and then keep them motivated by going there. So we need groups like... I was saying before that you have to have great partnerships with your local community. And I'm really good, thankful that we have, um, you know, working with Kokiri CBU Marae, Oronga Marae, Wanyo Mata Marae, and then our agencies outside of that, Kai Bosch Wellington, Kai Bosch Lower Heart, you know, um, or Lower Heart Food Bank, Stokes Valley Food Bank, great people who really want to be able to help our communities and are able to help the people that we are servicing and so um you know that 170 dollars will go a little way towards uh, supporting our families but i agree with um susan you know that the benefit needs to be reviewed uh reviewed that let's look at what those 47 um you know for it with 47 percent looks like anyway for um for our families so that would be a start. 
And I yeah. agree with oh. Susan, that's a great start. All that great help that people like the food banks are doing, all that energy could be put to something else if families didn't have to go to the food banks. You know, there could be community gardens, there could be a whole lot of other things happening, which rather than this ambulance at the bottom of the cliff. So it's not as if the community wouldn't still be helping out and creating a more vibrant place. But yes, yeah, Susan, what was your reaction to those? I mean, the National Party's only suggestion, as far as I can see, is to bring back the um, penalties of a mother doesn't name the father. Um, and well, Labour's, as I said, what's your reaction to the main parties, those two those two um, suggestions? Well, the Nationals' reaction is expected and just disgraceful in light of the problems that we're seeing. But Labour's was intensely disappointing and, uh, you know, that training centre of allowance, which you know to be in its lawyers upstream and comments at the lane as having benefited from, is about Oh, at least a dozen others in prominent positions who have also been affected. That policy of bringing it back, I think, is deeply cynical. If it was a policy that they had their heart in bringing back, they should have done it immediately they got elected. Why wait until now and use it as a bribe to say, if you vote for us, then we will bring this in? If it's worth doing, it should have been done three years ago. And similarly, with the raising of the abatement level, um, it just seems to me to be deeply simple and display a lack of imagination in the part of Labour if that is the best that we can come up with. Um, and to go back to Serena's point, that yes, those that can earn that extra $160 per week, um, of course, they will be better off than they were without that. But We've just come through the COVID period. We're in a very deep recession, and part time work of all kinds, particularly low school part time work, has not been at all easy to get and will remain very difficult for a period. We're in a very deep recession. So it's not enough just to say, and this is the idea of putting work at the centre, that the way on poverty is worked, therefore we're going to allow you to work a bit more, and that way you'll get ahead. We have to have something in place that does not rely on that. Because there's simply not going to be the jobs. Well, there isn't at the moment, and there's not a great um, prospect of it in the immediate future. Just as an economist, the a lot of people have said, and it, it rings true to me, that it, it would be hard to think of a more efficient stimulus package than increasing benefits. Would, would you agree with that, that as far as getting money out into the community, it's likely to all be spent? Oh, look, I totally agree, and I agree as well with what you said before about the activity that goes into finding food from food banks. And, of course, you get a food parcel. It may not have food that is culturally appropriate to your family. It's an extremely inefficient way of people accessing sufficient food of the right kind. So from an economist's point of view, um, let me think, we've got low productivity in this country. We've got so many people running around doing jobs that they really shouldn't be doing if we had systems that work properly. Just to talk about some of the other things which are on offer, I mean, the Greens, who are likely to be part of the next government, have got a, a more generous policy, a universal um, or a, a minimum wage, isn't it? A, a universal minimum wage of a, is it three twenty five a week, which would go to students as well. I imagine that's attractive to you, Donna. Well, I mean, it's better than it's it's better than what we have now. I mean, student allowance is one of those funny ones that's always left out of conversation when it comes to benefits really it should be in there um something else that's always left out and i do not understand where this came from i'll have to have a look into it actually is somehow we cost more to feed once we are over 24 than when we're before we turn 24 <laughs> um 
I would like to think that if there was if Labor don't govern alone, that there will be a lot more pushback from the Greens this time round. Whether that will actually eventuate, I don't know. And maybe that's my age. And I'm feeling quite cynical about the whole thing, having already witnessed the preceding three years. The, the few things I've seen that have given me hope have been basically quite direct community based responses like the remakery and the food projects that are going on out in the hut there's yeah. almost nothing like that in the inner city here we don't have our community gardens here anymore they're gone mm. you know there might be one left that's it and you know, I, haven't so, seen, I haven't seen any policies being proposed even by the mm. greens to try the remakery for listeners who don't know it is a Hutt Valley initiative which started off in a school with a garden giving kids food at the local school and has community gardens all over the area um, and is a great example of what can be achieved by you know the power of community and it, you could see you know I mean you could have a gardener and a cook in every school, for example, or policies that actually promoted self-reliance and and on a universal basis, so all kids would benefit. But I haven't seen anything like that, you know, uh, that tries to build community in that sense. Um, I, I haven't seen any obvious move away from the neoliberal framework, basically. You know, I and, and perhaps I am being a little too cynical, but I mean, I'm 56 now. I have watched and heard these conversations and debates. I mean, I wasn't here through the 90s, but it feels like for a long time now, and I haven't seen anything at a government level that makes me feel help, hopeful, and I, I don't feel that particularly at any specific political party level either and I don't think I'm particularly alone in that <laughs> how about you Serena excuse me can I pick up on what you were saying about our community gardens and the work that Julia does at um, the remakery which was really helpful because actually the remakery were part of the team that was um, delivering brush um, the uh, Greens, the vegetables, all the vegetables came out from Julia, Julia and her team and um, came out to, you know, all the organisations that I've been working with under COVID-4, 3 and, and today. But, um, yeah, you're right. You know, these are some of those things about us starting to be able to not be the ambulance at the bottom of the hill or the cliff, but actually be those organisations that are... Um, that are growing our families and what have you. Um, I operate our, the Pumata Community House and we've got a garden. And one of the commitments that we've made is to bring our families, our local families together again to do, you know, to do these kind of things. Um, you know, it's kind of, COVID-4 reminded us that going back to the basics was really important. You know, um, families were really worried when they got to the, to the, um, um, to their local stores or even at the supermarket and seeing cupboards were like shelves were empty. That was scary for a lot of people. So, um, you know, coming back to, to the basics of growing some food from your home, growing food together, um, like Julia has been able to do with um, her and her team at the remakery. Um, Cookery Seaview are doing that over in Wainui and Master. So there's a whole lot of hubs of us coming together, and and it's part of um, our um, part of it. What we want to do is actually come together and and provide these kind of um, places. I mean, I, you know, I'm stationed right now at uh, Richmond in Christchurch, and I've just been up the road to um, to have a look at their um, Brush, uh, the garden, their food garden, and they've got a bicycle store there that on the same place that will do um, kids' bikes, teach you how to uh, um, take care of your bike. Um, there's another place there that's got an opportunity shop where people can drop clothes off and what have you, and they can, you know, um, 
recycle them around the community for different age groups and what have you. They've got a little coffee shop in there. So these are the kinds of things that we as organisations um, can come together to look at doing. Because this, I think um, Julia is way on ahead of that. But also in Low Heart, as we're on base, we've got a whole lot of stations of things. And I think it's coming together. Like, where is everything? So is and, and so for me, it was about where are all the food outlets because my families are everywhere. So, you know, we're servicing the whole of the Hutt Valley and, um, and Upper Hutt. But so are a lot of other people and organisations and marae and all the different Pacifica um, organisations. We all are, are contributing our, our 1% into the community and so it's like the not you know bringing the 99 percent together so with our one our extra one percent can make a difference for our families and if the government thought like that it would be so much better for our for the families that we're supporting Kia ora. susan the welfare state was born out of that kind of idea it, it was the whole community together buying into this idea that, that we are a community and that nobody, we shouldn't go through the types of poverty people had seen in the Depression. Is that, is the problem, you know, that started in 1991 or maybe before even, of a kind of comfortable New Zealand just leaving people to rot but not riot? On, on almost starvation rations, do we need to reinvent the welfare state for the 21st century? Mm. Yes, and it's been that creation of the other that has come out of the 1991 period and intensified. So you're right, we do need to get back to a completely different way of looking at welfare. And maybe the first thing that we should do is go back to the Social Security Act and look at the purpose and principles that Labour put in place in 2007. And you'll see there that paid work is enshrined. There's about nine references to paid work in the Social Security Act purpose and principles. So the Welfare Expert Advisory Group, one of the main things that it said right up front was we've got to review that. We have to set out, we've got to articulate what our values are and incorporate Māori values, be inclusive. And once we've got that right, then we've got more chance of undoing the damage that's been done. But at the moment, um, all of our laws are based on this attitude that we find written into the Act. The bureaucrats are having to upgrade that law so they don't feel they can do anything. Um, and until we have the leaders that actually grasp us and start to talk to us as a society that needs to up our game on this, nothing's going to change. I agree with what Dan said, but um, it's a bit cynical. You could look forward a bit cynically for the next three years, more of the same, more tinkering around the edges. Shall we just have a quick, I can just describe some of the policies on offer from the other political parties just very quickly. So the Māori Party wants an immediate doubling of benefits. The Social Credit Party has quite generous um, increases which they're proposing. I forgot, I think 470, um, so close to what the government actually gave people as a result of COVID is what the Social Credit Party believes. And then the one which I think um, it probably gets the most talk, and maybe we can just talk about very quickly, is TOP's proposal for a universal basic income. Um, it's an idea which seems to be gaining in popularity. Uh, Jeff Simmons, the leader of TOP, when he describes the system, he says that it's a choice between, um, what's his word? It, 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 um, adequacy and incentives. And he says, that if you want to get the incentives right and get rid of the, um, the poverty trap, then you have to, you, you won't be able to have 
the adequacy. I, I was quite surprised that he put it that starkly. But um, Donna, have you thought about it at all? Are, are you a fan of the UBI? Um, I have mixed feelings about the UBI. I, my understanding is what they're looking at in Finland at the moment is that the UBI on its own um, isn't enough. So they are looking at introducing things like free tertiary education, not free all education, but specifically having a focus on tertiary education. So that the UBI in isolation and how that's set, uh, how it's reviewed, that sort of detail, I don't know of a good working model but I do know they have been using it. I'm fairly sure I'm right that it's Finland and they're having, they are re-looking at it, uh, having, having rolled it out. Um, I think the complication is that we don't have an example, isn't it, really? I mean, it's... Um... Well, I, I think so. And I mean, I also have a bit of an issue with the 33% right across the board tax thing that we're talking to. Yes, I do. You, you thought um, about it at all, Serena? You've heard about the universal basic income idea where everyone would be, everyone, including you know, millionaires down to, I think children would all get 250 a week. So it's kind of a negative tax in effect. And then, then you pay a higher tax rate. Um, so what they say is that anyone working will be better off up until, I've forgotten what the figure is, it might be 80,000 or something. And that nobody will be worse off. That's what they claim on the benefits. Um, that I imagine that means some of them will be as badly off as they are now. Um, no, uh, we, you know what, we've been in the coal face um, for a long time now, working specifically with our families who are in need. And so it's, it's important, I think, uh, though, to uh, a friend of mine said bungee jump. And so every now and again, we bungee jump out to see what actually is happening. And, and this is one of those, um, Jeremy, this is a bungee for me. Um, it gives me an opportunity to see what um, what's happening on the horizon for our families and what have you. And actually really think about what's happening for, um, for uh, not just our families, but the, the, the community, for the communities of people that we're actually serving. And it's... Um, with people like Donna and like Susan, it's important to have you at the coalface because you provide us with the, um, with the confidence that going forward, the work that we're doing with our families and what have you, because we were right on the coalface with them, we're working and we're walking that journey with our families. So when you are on the ground, that's what you're doing. So we, this gives us an opportunity bungee jump out of that and have a look what's actually happening around the country and what is happening, uh, what's being said by a whole lot of um, uh, the political parties, Jeremy, as you've outlined what's going on with their um, policies mm -hmm. and what have you. Mm -hmm. And, it, you know, all of it seems great. Um, okay. and it, all of it seems great. But what, what gets me is what Susan said, why don't, why weren't people, why weren't the government doing this three years ago, having a policy on this and making a difference in that area. You know, um, so it's kind of like these, all these um, policies that these new, these new uh, parties are putting together, you know, the majority, I can tell you, the majority of our people will be saying, liars, yeah. <laughs> they won't believe it. <laughs> They won't. They don't believe what is actually what people, what government is saying now, or even the parties that are coming through, because the majority of people have have been stuck, as Susan said, since 1991, since 2007, and we've got all these these young people coming up, and uh, you know, if we if we have a great balance, I think of work and beneficiary and, and the things that people are in. Um, yeah, because there's no no simple answer. I think there's no simple answer to, to everything because everyone has a different, you know, different things happening in their families and what have you. Absolutely. And they will, yeah, so, impact it in different ways. So Susan, maybe I, we're going to have to wrap up soon, but if, if you could have a, I, 
I know you will have thought about the UBI. Do you have a quick comment on that? And then maybe your, your wish for the next three years, what is the most urgent thing that needs to be done in terms of benefit levels? Oh my goodness. Well, quickly on the basic income idea, I think it's good that TOP is raising these issues. They've got a very complex arrangement. Of course, it's not just talking about the basic income, but it's also tax on housing. And so it all fits together, and it's hard just to look at one bit in isolation. My fear is what Donna was saying, that the problem with the universal basic income is that it can be set too low and is likely to be too low. And then, of course, you still need to have the top ups. But I would also say that we need to appreciate in New Zealand that we already have a basic income. We've got New Zealand super. And we could change that into a proper basic income and show people how it works, pay everybody um, a net amount, and then put the other income on a separate tax scale so that essentially you claw it back from the top um, super annuitants. And once we've got that up and working, showing how it works and how good it is, then maybe extend it to self parents with young children or um, other groups such as disabled people. Um, we've also got, believe it or not, we have a basic income for children. People just don't appreciate this. There is a cushion there. So then people lose the work and fall below 42,700, they get an automatic payment for working for families that is the same for everybody. So up to 42,700, working for families is the same for everybody. So as you lose work, you go into this cushion, which is a basic income for children. We just don't appreciate the way that um, it's structured, that it actually is performing that function. So broadening up the discussion is great. So very quickly, because I know you want to wrap up, what would you do in the next year? What would I like to see? Well, obviously, we've got to prioritise the elimination of poverty. And that means we've got to seriously look at the core benefits. But we also need to reform working for families, make it a proper universal basic income for all families, and don't cut the poorest out of $72.50 a week. Another thing that has to be done that we haven't talked about today is to individualise benefits and stop criminalising marriages. So people who are on benefits who are deemed to be in couples get far less than they would get if they were two single people sharing. That is wrong. That rate has to be increased so that there's parity with single people. And then we've got to take away the joint income test as well. Um, we have to encourage good relationships, not penalise them. Um, and there's a raft of other things, but those, those are the major ones. Donna, what would you like to see over the next year or two? Exactly really what, what Susan just said, and I would like to see that um, arbitrary age of 24 gone. Um, I don't even understand how that could be considered rational, that somebody somehow is it's more expensive for them to live the day they turn 24. So I'd like to see that gone, but I agree with absolutely everything Susan said, and also the revisiting and looking at the core principles that should be underpinning the legislation that just are not there. I mean, it has been tinkered with and tinkered with, and it's Sorry, there's a huge number of things that I work with quite regularly called directives. They are so broad and open to interpretation. So, yeah, the framework of the Act needs changing as soon as possible. But basically everything that Susan said is what I would like to say. Serena. What can I say? I... You know, I believe that um, our families aren't getting enough to live on, and that's why they need the food banks. Um, I agree that uh, I hope whichever government gets in, that actually they're working with us, with the community organisations, working with our families to actually let's 
let's teach a man to fish. Let's do that rather than feed him for a day, which we're currently doing as organisations. Let's try and help out, support our families as um, best we can. But government needs to step in and act, actually help us to do this. I appreciate your um, input today, Susan. That was really great. I, I think yeah, um, you've done the hard yards in terms of the um, research around you know, benefit levels and what should be raised and what even, I totally agree. Uh, our families are in need right now, and I hope that over this next 12 months, the government responds to that and do it quickly. Kia ora. Kia ora. Okay, I think, I think that's us. I mean, one, the, from the one thing I, you know, felt kind of outraged by was the, increased benefit that people got as a result of COVID, you know, so if you're made redundant as a result of COVID, suddenly it didn't matter whether you're in a relationship or not, and you got twice as much as somebody else. And it feels to me that COVID was this incredible opportunity to actually say we're all in this together. And you could have had, like you did, you had Jacinda Ardern say that she should take a 20% pay cut. And we could have gone into it in quite a different way with, with a shared, we're all in this together. You know, in the Second World War, I'm always amazed that um, malnutrition went down as a result of the rationing that took place in, in Britain. And so in hard times, the poor don't need to suffer more they can in fact benefit because people accept there is a shared um, response. And it feels to me we're missing that. I, I don't know whether any of you have a similar feeling. Jeremy, you know, okay. one thing that I'm worried about, especially um, up and coming, we've got a whole lot of people living in uh, motels at the moment. Where are they gonna go? Because the government, you know, the government hasn't got enough housing. Um, you know, one of the things that maybe the government can respond to is um, instead of putting people into motels, why doesn't the government negotiate with families? The same as you meet in a family group conference and see where the families can come together to make the solution be that they can support their family at their home. You know, because sometimes if they're there, because Government, as you know, is pay, paying thousands of dollars a week for a family to be in the in a motel right now. But, it, it, you know, the, those are kind of some of the out-of-the-box thinking that some of our team have been. Why can't they go with family? Why can't Housing New Zealand let somebody have a um, cabin outside so they can bring, you know, a small family that's moved from one place to another? Um, to the home. So things like that, that there's no response. Um, and we've been talking to government for the last, I think it might be three years actually, about why can't they do that, especially in overcrowding and whatever that, because that could be so helpful. But, you know, we've got all these people in hope and uh, motels, some in transitional housing, some who don't want to go into transitional housing because some people that are there actually are still taking drugs and what have you, and these families, these people want to actually be cut from that altogether. So housing is going to be a big, a major one up and coming um, in this past 12, in these, uh, in these next 12 months. Okay. So I'm interested to see what's going to happen with that. Susan, any thoughts on, on whether the COVID is an opportunity for a, a reset? Yes, um, as you say, what it showed is that government can act function if it feels like it if, it, if it decides to. So the idea that it always has to be some time in the future that we do things is just not tenable anymore. And we need to make sure that when, they, when the next government gets in, that there's action immediately, that we don't have a budget that says, oh, we'll do something in 2022. And that's the sort of thing that they have been doing. They've been delaying, bringing in small changes and then slightly better changes further down the track, but only after a year. We've got to stop them and make deliberate 
in significant changes. And Liz, if we don't do that, we're going to slide into third world conditions, which are completely inappropriate in a country like New Zealand. Final word to you, Donna. Sorry, I just had to shoot and let the dog out. What oh, final word oh, over? Yeah, I said our oh, <laughs> final word was uh, whether COVID offer, offers us an opportunity to to transition to a new type of economy or a more caring society. I would like to think. I mean, I think again, I agree with Susan. It certainly proved that the government can act very speedily when it chooses to do so. I think. One of the things I notice is I think we've become quite a disconnected society and that mindset of circumstances that people find themselves in for whatever reason. There are so many people now that parrot this thing of poor choices. And that sort of mentality seems to have really taken hold in my mind over the, I'm sure it's longer, but I've really noticed it over the last decade. So I think on one hand, yes, it could be a great opportunity and we have seen the government move quickly um, on, on certain issues, but I still think that we are, we suffer in a way with this attitude of not wanting to scare this other weird phrase, um, Middle New Zealand. And I think that particular mentality is, is problematic for our, for our country. Okay, look, I think I think that's kind of us, really. Um, we could obviously go on and on. Uh, <laughs> I had a, a mate called Bill Mong who used to say that Rangatahi was the most um, underutilised natural resource in the country. And I kind of think, you know, people people say to me we can't afford to do these things. I, I really think we just can't afford not to. Um, mm. Yeah. Hey, but thanks all very much.